So um, let's pray again for, for our time in the scripture um, and ask the Lord's help. Lord, we thank you for um, the certainty of your word that you are in our midst. And indeed, Lord, the certainty that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we, Lord, pray, therefore, as we turn to your scripture, that we might esteem it rightly. And Lord, chiefly, though, that you might give us that spiritual understanding that is necessary, not that we're growing knowledge and be puffed up, but that we're growing love and holiness and faith. And so please, Lord, lead us on and grant us great grace this evening. And thank you for our time. Amen. Well, I'm um, very lovely to be with you all tonight. And thank you for all those who join us in various places. And we'll continue to keep all those matters in prayer lifted up before the Lord that I mentioned earlier on. So we're in John chapter 17, and uh, I'll read from verse 13, John chapter 17 and verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keepest them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And I'd like tonight to speak. Uh, it's impossible. It's not a Bible study and I won't be exhaustive tonight. But a few thoughts on our sanctification, our sanctification that is taken from verse 17 of John, of John 14, of John 17. Forgive me. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Is it's, a, it's such an important topic, isn't it? And uh, it's something that I believe we should reflect on to evaluate where we are in the Lord, but also just to have a clear sight on the thrilling prospect that it is, but also the provision that God has made for us to be made like him. And you could say very simply that that is what it is to be sanctified, isn't it? To be transformed from what we used to be in our old man before we knew Christ and transformed into the image of Christ here that those old elements of our old man would be put to death and instead we'd find uh, the fruit of our faith coming forth in the holy life that we live but it's not only just the matter of being holy in the manner that we are but it's it is also isn't it to be set apart to God's purposes it's not that we are, as it were, that sanctification is a selfish thing, that I'll be therefore preserved to myself, as we'll, as I'll see a little bit later from the scripture. But it is that we might be set apart to the Lord's purpose. And I won't turn there now, but it, it, the term is also used of the Levitical priests um, in the Old Testament, that it was said of them that they were sanctified to the Lord. It was it meant both that they were holy, that they didn't touch anything unclean, but they were also, as it were, set apart to God's purposes. They were his specific people. And this is uh, what the will of God is for us as Christians and, and people in all ages in the world, that we would be sanctified people to him. But before I turn into that, and I won't be speak for long tonight, but it's worth just reflecting on the context in John chapter 17, as this is rightly the some by, termed by many as the high priestly prayer, the, the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed just before he would go to his agony and, and his suffering. The last section of uh, John's gospel is many times is accorded by being six events are described as being, say, six days before the Passover or just before the Passover. And Christ begins his prayer in chapter 17, in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. The hour of the Passover, where that spotless lamb would be slain for the sins of the world. And there's no better title of it, is it? You might say, well, what time is it? It is the time the hour, the central event of all time, the most important, significant thing that would ever take place in the history of the world was about to happen. It was the hour, the hour also that Christ 
was appointed and the reason why he came. Just a little bit earlier, in chapter 12 and verse 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. And what is his soul troubled about, about the hour? It is, of course, that his soul is about to be made an offering for our sin. The Lord Jesus Christ's hour of crucifixion, of bearing the wrath of God upon the cross has come. But he follows that exclamation in John 12 by saying, Father, glorify thy name. And it's very thrilling what happens next. And I'm sure those who know him well, that Christ is praying and, and there came a voice from heaven saying there was an immediate response from heaven of the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer to his father. Lord, what shall I say? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And heaven answered audibly with a thunder. And he said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. We might well say, mightn't we? Amen to that, to that truth of him glorifying his name. But it's interesting what Jesus says straight after that to his disciples. He said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. In other words, that the reason why the father, God, the father answered God, the son audibly was not so that Christ would take comfort and know that his prayer had been heard and take courage unto the hour. But it was for the sake of those who were there that they would know that this is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, who has come to this hour, which we now come to in his prayer in John chapter 17, the hour. And rather as the discourse um, at the Last Supper runs from really John chapter 13 to where we are in John chapter 17, it begins by Christ not first actually teaching them by words, but Christ first teaching them through his example. Do you remember the first thing that Christ did when they came to that Last Supper? He, he took off and laid aside his garments. He got that bowl of water and he washed the disciples' feet. And then, having done that, he then taught them. What an illustration about what Christ was doing in going to the cross. The Lord of glory was laying aside all of his glory and majesty to become a servant who would, who would wash the feet of his disciples. And he was not going to but just wash them in water, but he was going to wash them from their sin in his own blood, just just hours hence from that point. And in the same way we find in his high priestly prayer, if I might say that in John 17, that his zeal is for the glory of God. And then he prays, not for himself, but he prays for believers in all times and in all places. And if you take away nothing else from tonight, be encouraged in this, that if you are the, the weakest, feeblest Christian in your estimation, know that Christ has prayed for you in that he includes you within this prayer now. And this prayer that he gives, that, he, that the believers will be sanctified. And the reason why this is so necessary, of course, is the terrible crisis the disciples were about to face, that the, the Lord, their shepherd, who had been with them for these 33 years, with whom they'd spent these last three years or so, in his presence and he had instructed them he had hadn't he sometimes rebuked them when they went wrong he provided food for them hadn't he when they were being taxed and they needed money it came from christ when they were being accused by the pharisees or sadducees it was the lord jesus christ who responded who protected them when they were going amiss in their thinking and thought and were disputing amongst themselves who should be the greatest it was Christ, wasn't it, who, who instructed them? And wasn't he so meek and gentle in the manner with which he did so? Really, he was their very present help, their good shepherd who was with them. And now, though, sorrow has filled their hearts because he's about to go away. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, focus of his prayer is on the church, therefore, in his absence. 
And turning to our text verse, he says in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. And isn't this a very important principle that Christ doesn't take us out of the world? We find all of us, don't we, in various places and employments. There are very few of us in what we would say would be full time Christian employment. If you understand what my meaning is, we are, aren't we, still out in the world in the midst of uh, of this generation. The moment someone's saved, they are not, as it were, shot in an instant into the presence of God, having been justified, are they? We we are left in the world and we are left, as it were, without the visible presence of Christ, our shepherd, with us. But instead, Christ prays to the Father and says, not that God would take us away from where we are, but God would preserve us where we are, that we would be sanctified through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And and very briefly, uh, just a little, a few things that I'd like to say about this as I move through uh, three brief points. And the first is his will is our sanctification. Now, there are many, aren't there, who who over the years seek the counsel of God in what they should do in their life and these big decisions. Uh, and it's right, I believe, we should do. In fact, King David went wrong, didn't he? Because he sought not the counsel of God. And it's clear, isn't it, that we should seek his counsel. But at times we don't get the macro things right. that are the most fundamental things of the will of God. And if we would put those right, then the smaller things, the smaller decisions of life would naturally be sorted out. And, and the greatest macro things we might say of all are that the will of God is that we should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of our sins. But I think second, that follows very closely to that, is that we might live holy lives. And, and if we were to take that principle and apply it to some of our decisions, then sometimes it would be quite apparent what we maybe shouldn't do and what we should. I thought of the example of Lot, righteous Lot. We should call him rightly as the scripture did. But do you remember how he saw all the plains of Jordan and how beautiful they were and abundance and he chose to live in the cities of those plains, which included Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he saw that they were an attractive place to live and he went there. But it's interesting that God's estimation of that place was entirely different. In fact, what does the Lord say of them? It says that they were wicked and, uh, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He didn't view it as a beautiful area. He viewed it as a, an exceedingly sinful area that grieved his heart. And yet Job chose to live there. And you might say, well, he was holy and he vexed his righteous soul day by day going there. He, he did, didn't he? But he made that choice to go there, maybe allured by its plenteous provision. And we can also say that when he was drawn out from there by the angels with his immediate family, his wife looked back, didn't she? And was turned into a pillar of salt. And, and as has been said by many others, it wasn't the fact that she heard a noise behind her and a remarkable sight and turned back to see what was happening. But the implication is she had something of a longing heart back to those things that she was leaving behind that she didn't want to. And could we not say, remember Lot, as J.C. Ryle preached an excellent sermon on, where Lot chose somewhere that maybe he should not have done so. And isn't it sometimes that we forget that the, the macro will of God, which Christ here prays for the church, of all the things he could pray for, and there are other things in the, in the passage I won't look at now, but maybe the chief idea is our sanctification. This was what was on the heart of Christ, that not only would we be saved from our sins by him dying for us upon the cross. That was that. But it was it was that we would then be people who would be kept by the father through the truth and able to live holy lives. 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1 has just that very simple statement. This, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And we see, don't we, 
the triune God, God the Son, praying to God the Father, sanctify them. And the means being why, by which we are sanctified, being by the word of God, by the spirit of God working that in us. This, you could say truly, is this is the will of God, even our sanctification. Secondly, uh, how is this performed? Because thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see that he is both praying, uh, it, it generally praying for the will of God to be done. But also he is also instructing us, isn't he? And that this prayer, there aren't many prayers of Christ that are that have been recorded in Scripture. But there are some and this is one of them for our education and our, and our instruction. But he says this, how are we sanctified through thy truth? Thy word is truth. The scripture is is it referred to in various ways, isn't it, by itself. But one of them, it is called the scripture of truth. And it, likewise, here we have the statement, thy word is truth. The, the everything that proceeds from the mouth of God that is recorded for us is truth. Rather like we might say that Christ refers to his hour of crucifixion as the hour. The, everything that God says is truth truth is the truth and something by which we can uh, live by but it is also the means that God has provided for the church to be sanctified I'm not going to ju jump around much tonight but back in chapter 16 of John it's worth just looking at how he refers to the spirit he says I have in verse 12 chapter 16 of verse 12 I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. You see, Christ has left us not alone in that he says it's expedient for you that I go. Of course, because if he had not died and been raised from the dead, we would yet be in our sins. But it's also that in going, he would send the Holy Spirit down, who would then indwell in every believer. And what does Christ call him? The spirit of truth, because he will take what God has said, what God the Father and the Son have said, and he will apply it. He will reveal it. He will speak to us. And he is the spirit of truth. And it is the back in John chapter 17 of verse 17. His word is truth. And his word is the way that we are sanctified. Isn't that an important thing just to dwell on a little bit? As uh, you know, we might be discouraged and there are all of us who wish that we were further on in our walk of sanctification. It is a process, isn't it? Unlike justification, which is instantaneous, sanctification is something that goes on through all our life. And in one respect, we always feel that we're not where we would wish to be. But thank God that in his great mercy, the great provisions that God has made, he has given us the scripture of truth. And he's also given us the spirit of truth. It's not in our natural man that this takes place, but it is through the operation of the third person of the Trinity, of the very Godhead working in us to sanctify us. It would be a horrendous accusation known blasphemous to imply that Christ had left us untended do you remember the accusation that was made to David before he was king by his brothers when his father sent him to take provisions to his brothers who'd gone to fight against the Philistines with the incident with Goliath and his brothers see David and they they rebuke him and they say you've just left the sheep haven't you you're just as it were wanting to come and watch the battle and you've neglected your duties and they put that accusation upon him don't they it was so far from the truth David had been sent by his father and he was performing the will of his father in going forth and of fact it was it was of God wasn't it because he then fought Goliath but Christ has not left us without provision for our holiness he's not left us in a in an enemy country without the resources to be able to not just stand, but to perform the will of God. He has given us the spirit of truth and the word of truth. 
And before I move on, isn't it important to remember that, it, that the right application of the scripture, evidence that the spirit who is working in us is the Holy Spirit, is that he leads us on to sanctification. Uh, and it's a very basic thing to say. But over the years, there have been many false spirits in the church which have not manifested that work in the believer. And we could assuredly say that those are not the spirit of God if they do not elevate the scripture and elevate holiness. It is nothing of God. You can see countless works of revival over the years, can't you? True works of revival. What has it led to? It, it's led to elevation of the scripture and holiness of life. This is the thrilling provision which God has made. And no wonder in Ephesians 6, we have that injunction, taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, this sharp two-edged sword that pierces even to the divining asunder of bone and marrow. Of the, it's a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's, it is that sharp. This is the provision that the Godhead has made for us to be sanctified. And the last thing, if I might say this tonight, it's no small thing either. It is a mighty and great thing that God has given us. What do I mean by that? Well, you might wonder of all the things that Christ could well have asked his father for in his high priestly prayer. Would you have expected that our sanctification would be the thing on which he would focus? And indeed, let's take note of that in the manner that we pray for one another. This is the will of God. And we can be sure if we pray for one another in this way, that we're praying according to the mind of God. But is it just a small thing that he should ask for? But actually, is it not? Is this not showing that this is one of the great things, one of the fundamentals of the Christian life, that Christ has not only made provision for us to be justified and forgiven by God, but he's made provision for us to be free from sin, that we might follow him in holy life, now, this is part of the great whole work of redemption of Christ in the soul. It is the great thing. And if I might just illustrate this by one, think of the provision that is made in the case of Daniel. When he was taken by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to exile. And uh, after Jerusalem was dest partially destroyed, he was carried away as a as a young man there, and what the Babylonians did was they took certain of the children of Israel of the king's seed and of princes, and they brought them to Babylon. And the reason was that they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans, in other words, the Chaldean language, but also their ways and their learning. And, and indeed, Daniel was given the name of one of even of the gods of Babylon. They changed his name to try to really indoctrinate him and bring him into that assimilate him into their culture but there's a but isn't there Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself and therefore as you know what did he do he decided he asked for permission not to eat meat sacrificed or wine sacrificed to idols but just to be given vegetables so that it pulsed so that he would his conscience before God would be right and we know what God did with him see that that desire to be holy meant that Daniel was established of God and, and was used of God to bring mighty deliverance. And, and such the whole book of Daniel resulted, didn't it, from that decision. And we're not giving praise to Daniel. I don't mean to do that, but that God, but to show the importance of sanctification from Daniel's decision to be sanctified, not to defile himself, came the great works in the book of Daniel, that even Christ would quote when he talks about that abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. See, what fruit came from this? And in our own lives, some of the greatest actions that we might ever take might be those to make ourselves and focus on our sanctification. Just one scripture to refer to, to show that I'm not distorting or reading to things that's wrong in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21 in instructing in practical holiness 
Uh, Paul says to Timothy, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You see, if we are people who are cleansed ourselves from those things that are wrong in us, those, those things that spoil, we will then be ready for our, our master's use prepared unto every good work. So we might say that this is the principal thing, isn't it? Once we're born again and saved, it is that, am I now sanctified? And as I said at the beginning, that doesn't mean that I'm set apart from everyone else onto my own ends. It's not that, is it? That I'm prepared for my master's use. I'm prepared unto every good work. What can follow from the soul that is sanctified? And as I've said at the start, I'm not suggesting that sanctification is an instantaneous thing. I know some have allowed that. And if I might respectfully suggest it is something that goes on through our lives. But but nonetheless, we can go on and be more and more sanctified, can't we, through our lives. And as we do so, we are more and more ready unto the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And who knows how the Lord will use us? He might choose to use us very privately, but for a work that no man sees, but only God sees. Or he might choose to use us to preach to nations such as Daniel or Ezekiel. We don't know, do we? But what that use would be that God would have of us will be performed. And isn't that what we would wish for our lives? That the will of God might be done in my life, not my will, but that his will might be done. The works he's appointed for me that they might be performed. The things for which he saved me might indeed be done in my life. And doesn't this come from our sanctification? Isn't this why the Lord Jesus Christ prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He has given us the spirit of truth. He has given us his truth. And afterwards, he will receive us to glory. And if I might finish with this one thought from John chapter 17, we might say, oh, but we've never seen Christ. And, and how about if, you, uh, if only we were alive then and we could have seen his ministry. But thank God, his promises in, or his prayer is in verse 24 of chapter 17. Father, I will that they whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, that they may behold my glory. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ while we're alive now, we don't see his glory, do we? We don't see him with our eyes, his fullness of how he is and who he is. But what he prays is that now we'll be sanctified, kept ultimately for that day when we will see him as he is, when we'll see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Isn't that something to be sanctified unto, to press towards the mark of the high calling in the Lord Jesus Christ? So, brethren, may we give due and right emphasis to sanctification. As I said, I, I've not been able to give full justice to the depth and breadth of this subject, but sufficiently to say, let's be ones who therefore take the word of life, ask that the Spirit of God will speak to us, will mould us, search us, instruct us, that Christ might seal the travail of his soul in our lives. Amen. Well, I wonder if we might finish tonight by um, singing that um, hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. You know, we can't, I, I, I am of the view that sanctification isn't something which we make a pronouncement, a decision right now, you know, as in a call to salvation that we perform now. And so I don't mean us to sing this hymn in that, that manner, but we can pray, can't we, that God would indeed work in every area of our life and sanctify us and make us meet unto the master's use.
well, let's um, commit our way to the Lord. Feel free to stay on on the call afterwards if you have any needs or any um, or wish to stay on for fellowship. I'll leave the call open. Let's commit our way now to the Lord. So Lord, we thank you indeed for this hour that you came to, where you bore the uh, the sorrow and the judgment of God upon your own soul, how you loved us unto the end. And we thank you, Lord, for your prayer for us and the provision that has been made that we might be kept from this present evil world and that we might walk and fulfill those works you've given us to do. And so we pray, Lord, that we might indeed conform to the pattern of your will, that you would indeed sanctify us, Lord, keep us and work that good, pleasing and perfect will of God in our lives. Lord, we absolutely confess how weak the flesh is. But Lord, we pray that you would indeed make us willing, lead us on in the way you've appointed. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for our soul, how you've delivered us from death and delivered our feet from falling. And so we lift our way to you now, even this week, and pray you direct us, lead us, and cause your will to be done. Amen.